So um, anyway, um, as you know, we've had Marty Barron, we've had Elizabeth Warren, Richard Carson, and now we have my wonderful, wonderful colleague and friend, Rohit Chopra. I think you all have seen his, his background. Uh, it's an absolutely incredible background. Um, and uh, just very briefly, let me introduce him, and then we have an award for Rohit, just to embarrass you up front. Uh, and then we're, we're gonna do a whole bunch of questions on lots of very interesting things that he has done. But mostly, as I said, when I ask for your questions, everybody has to have one, okay, or we're locking the door. Um, so anyway, um, Rohit is, a, is actually, he's a legend in Washington and in the country in the student loan space. He will deny it and he is wrong. Um, <laughs> Rohit is the leading expert in student loan policy and has been for many years, um, despite what is not an, an old person, or who is not an old person. Um, uh, Rohit, for also for the last several months, he has served on the staff of Hillary Clinton's presidential transition team which we'll talk a little bit about as well in, in the questions, because that is- I'm not there anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least they're laughing. We could all be crying on that point. Um, so we'll, we'll ask a lot about that, and actually I find that fascinating. It's like a big black box. Who, what is that? What does that mean? So we'll talk about that. Um, Rohit is also a pen person. I meant to lead with that. He is a pen person. He went to Wharton. So that's exciting. He's come home and he, that was very No important. booze. I didn't hear any Wharton <laughs> booze. Yeah, yeah, no, well, not yet. Um, <laughs> we haven't gotten to Donald Trump. Whoops. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so in any case, um, so uh, before the transition team, Rohit was special advisor to the Secretary of Education, uh, where he was uh, instrumental in leading initiatives to reduce student loan defaults, hold colleges more accountable, and protect students, which we will also talk about at length. Before that, which is where I first met him, he was assistant director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Elizabeth Warren and Rich Cordray's uh, agency for the president. Um, and there, he was the student loan ombudsman, which is the only, you can ask him what that means, I can just about pronounce it. Um, but it, it's the only ombudsman created in the um, Dodd-Frank Act, uh, and Rohit held that position. Uh, and he, uh, and, and at the CFPB, he really, you really were a legendary um, and took aggressive action for the agency against student loan servicers, for-profit colleges, we'll talk about Corinthian and others, uh, which Rohit caused to go into bankruptcy, I believe, maybe, he can take credit for that, um, and actually brought hundreds of millions of dollars in refunds for consumers. He also has testified a whole lot in front of Congress, and if you are interested later, which is what I've done the last couple of nights, you can YouTube Rohit <laughs> testifying, and it is terrifying. You wanna sit alongside him, not opposite him at any table, so he's amazing uh, in front of congressional committees. Also went to Harvard and is a w the recipient of a Fulbright to the Republic of Korea. So, <laughs> remarkable background. Thank you very much for joining us. It is a joy to have you. Um, first, you get an award, however, um, even before you talk, and this is something we don't give out often. It is the Fells Award for Public Leadership. It is rarely given out, and it is because we rarely have someone of your caliber and your achievement. It recognizes exceptional individuals who lead with integrity, engender respect, and make a significant impact through your work. Well, and it is you. an honor thank to you. give this to you. Uh, and I don't know. It's like a vase. It is. It is a vase. It is a vase. Here, you have so. to take a picture. Look. <laughs> Before we break it. Yeah. Before we break it. Before we break it. So, um, with that, let me just start with some questions, and then, as I said, um, we will turn to you all, uh, because I think yours will be a lot more interesting probably than mine. But so we have an elephant in the room. We decided we moved the third chair. I was going to put an elephant in it, but we thought we would just start and ask ask you, Rohit, what you. Uh, what you thought about the results of the election, um, briefly, I promise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what your takeaways might be, what, your, what hope you might be able to give us, um, that, that sort of uh, first intro question about the election. Yeah, I think regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum, uh, there's no question that we have some serious problems about trust in our institutions. So. People don't trust um, big businesses. They don't trust government. They don't trust, frankly, institutions of higher education like they used to. And I think that that's really a big problem, um, the fact that these institutions feel like they're dictating parts of uh, our life without us being able to hold them accountable. 
You know, for those of us who have worked in Washington, even when you're trying hard to get things done, you, you know there's a lot of people who hold a lot of power behind the scenes who aren't really looking out in the public interest, and, and, and the public knows that. And I think part of what, regardless of where, what, where how you voted, there's no question that there's anger out there uh, at the establishment, and that I think is explaining part of the results. And we'll now see uh, what, what the consequences of that. And I think, I encourage you, I spent a lot of time looking through history about similar incidents where people really lashed out against the establishment. And some of it is deeply scary. Uh, there are parts of history where economic troubles really led to some ugly, ugly stuff. But sometimes um, there can be major change, and, and it's positive, and it leads to real reform. I'm not so confident we're going to get there in this context. I think a lot of it is the same old people who are going to be recycling the same bad ideas. Uh, but I think we have to fight. And for those of us, whether you support him, Donald Trump, whether you don't, you have to be part of fighting for change that you believe in. And that's really what keeps me hopeful about kind of being an American, is that uh, we're not, we're, we're not going to just sit and watch. We're going to actively yell with our voices and keep voting. And um, I hope this makes people, in some ways, wake up about the world around them. Good. Well, and I'm sure you all have have more questions on that topic if uh, if you'd like to bring it up again. So that's that's valuable. Um, so let's move to the transition team, which is sort of a segue towards um, student loans from uh, from the election. Tell us about that. I have never been involved in a transition team. I don't know how you get on it. How did you get mm -hmm. on it? How many were you? How did you divide up the world? Uh, what did you do? I mean. Did you create lists? Sure. And, and where would it have gone had it gone somewhere? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that was so unbelievably cool, we were on one floor and the Trumps were on the floor below. And there was a law passed in 2010 that the government provides support for each major candidate to plan out his or her government. And the reason why they did this was because during a financial crisis, we literally, you know, George W. Bush left during a financial crisis and, the, and President Obama took over. And you need to have real plans about how you're going to staff and think about what you're going to do. And 70 days isn't enough. So uh, if you look back to 2000, George W. Bush uh, dealt with 9-11. I think within 250 days of his presidency and did not have key intelligence officials and defense officials on board. So the idea is really a good government piece of it that people can start planning for what they would do if they were to win. Now, the, most, the reason why I loved it is because one of the things, and I, I really encourage those of you who are students in this program to really know that personnel in our government is everything. Who is in the rooms, what their values are, what they believe in, and what their willingness to work dictates so much about whether our society is fair, whether things work or don't work. And when you're able to put together a real team that knows their stuff, is willing to fight hard, and really believes in making some significant change, that is much better than, frankly, what we normally have. What we normally have in government is a bunch of people who see it as a stop on their way to getting more rich. They use it as a way to trade up on their experience and to ultimately sail through the revolving door, sometimes more than once, using your regulatory knowledge to curry favor with those who you regulate 
and then ultimately take a job with the person who you sat across the table from. And I just think that's wrong. We should not have a government where people who are making key decisions are kissing up to the people who they one day want to work for. You know, I, I think that that is so important for especially people who want to pursue public service. There is nothing wrong. I've done it too. I was in the private sector before entering government. But when you're in government, you are a public servant. You are not serving private interests. And I think that's really a key cause of why many people actually distrust government. And it's something we completely have to break. I was at the Department of Education uh, through much of this year. The previous three deputy secretaries of education, both Republican and Democrat, each one of them, after they left, one of them joined the board of a big student loan company and then went to a student loan debt collector. Another one start, went to a private equity fund, which is now buying a for-profit college or attempting to. And another one joined the board of another big for-profit school. So when you see that, you think to yourself, why? What, do, you, we're, are you switching sides? And there, I, I don't want to make a blanket statement that people can't join the private sector in an area that is related. But sometimes you feel like the people who are entering government are doing it not for public service, but mm -hmm. they're doing it to line their own pockets. Mm -hmm. And I just, mm -hmm. we, that's something that has to change. And it's why for mm -hmm. me, going to the transition mm -hmm. was a way to keep those people and their paws mm -hmm. off of our government. Rabbit Rohit, now you've, <laughs> like that. the back of the room comes through. Um, but Rohit, now you've depressed me because you started off by saying that, you know, it's, it's wonderful because if you have people in these positions who really know what they're doing, then you know the government starts off in the right way and it's planned ahead and so go back to what was it like having them on the floor below you and what did you actually do i mean how did they sure, divide sure. up what you did so i think I, I would actually encourage people to look at at some of the public documents that have been released over the history about how did how did presidents elect think about planning their government and one of the things they do is really pick very few areas that they're going to prioritize and find people who can really lead that. And um, much of it is personnel. Some of it is planning what's their first budget going to be, what's their first legislative fight going to be. So for me personally, I focused on a lot of the economic policy issues um, and seeing what should be the early move to execute on her campaign promises. And I actually think it was, it was nothing like working on a campaign. The campaign was focused on winning, and this was focusing on planning to make sure that the transition was smooth mm -hmm. and that um, on day one, someone was ready to serve, serve the public, mm -hmm. not just here at home, but also on the global stage. So everything from, for those of you who are interested in policy planning, some of it is really looking at the details of, would you like to pursue things through executive orders, through regulations? Do you want to fight for new authority um, by passing laws in Congress? Uh, do you want to appoint regulators to the independent agencies who share your philosophy? And too often, uh, over the past 30 years, some of those key officials are people, it's essentially auctioned off uh, to the donor class, and now more and more we have to make sure that it's actually people willing to protect the public mm -hmm. interest. Mm -hmm. So a criticism, you know, of this, um, of Hillary's failed campaign is that she didn't really run on a platform. She ran sort of, I'm not Donald Trump. And so did you see in, I mean, I would think in, you know, in your transition work, you would have seen her policy, what she, I mean, as you say, typically they choose a couple of issues, a couple of areas to focus on. We didn't see that in the campaign. Did you get a sense of what her well, focus would have been? I think many would agree with me that um, the volume of 
specific proposals she gave might have actually been too much, um, and that might have not mm -hmm. really gotten yeah. through. But in, in fact, there was a lot that she put forth that was very specific mm -hmm. of where she would go. I, and that's what, that's one of the things that's gonna be a challenge in watching this transition for the next 60 days is because there is not a lot of specificity, mm -hmm. there's a lot of question marks about mm -hmm. what he may or might not pursue. Right. How, how, how worried are you that, I mean, we hear there are 4,000 jobs to fill, right? And he's filled three or something. Um, I mean, I think literally, uh, as of yesterday, there were two. Um, and then I've heard that, for example, I have a friend at Treasury who said they were expecting 24 people from the transition, and then they said, no, actually, there's six coming, and then they canceled the whole visit. So are you worried that they're so far behind? Or Well, I have a whole host of worries, but they, the, 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 <laughs> How long do you have? <laughs> I, I, th I think that as a matter of, as a, as a citizen, we do want to make sure that there are people in place especially who can make sure that the core operations of our government, particularly as it relates to how we're represented overseas, are in place and on time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I <laughs> genuinely say this, while I did not support him, I, I wish him the best of luck yep. in trying to get a team um, early on mm -hmm. um, because you know he, is, he, he ought to have a team that mm -hmm. can help push <laughs> forward and not leave the American people vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we can come back to that if, if you all want to, and if not, we won't. Um, so let me turn to student student debt and student loans and your, your very big profile there, um, uh, which is fascinating to me. Um, so as you all probably know, student debt, and you probably have some of it, um, is the second largest debt category, I believe, in the country behind mortgages. This topic is clearly going to be depressing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you, you've, you've made a lot of great positive change, so I think it's actually very hopeful. But anyway, uh, but it's a trillion three, I think, and only mortgages is a larger category. Credit cards are smaller than student loan debt. There's 40 million Americans, I think, that have at some sort yep, of student loan. 43 so, million. Uh, et cetera. I guess 35,000 is the average. Um, graduating debt uh, of the current college, whatever. It's a lot of money, big problem. And you were truly, you and Elizabeth Warren were among the very earliest to focus on this and to shine a, a light on it and sound alarms. So I wonder just generally if you can give us some background, some context, and we'll get into some details. But um, what, what is the current state of play? Yes, yeah, so I think that a lot of people um, really looked at the student debt issue in the context of education and affordability of college. And I look at it very differently. In fact, there's other, some people in the audience here who have been wor working in legal aid and in advocacy who also will, can tell you that this is really an issue that is also about consumers, their families, and the economy. And you know, there's a lot of people who have been advocating cheaper tuition, free college. That's really not going to do anything for the 43 million people who already have student debt. So we really need to think about that and look at it from a consumer's lens and their own pocketbook. For I know that there's probably a diversity in ages amongst um, students in the program, but you know, if you rewind. 10 years ago where the mortgage cri bubble was beginning to get more and more inflated. And then in 2008, it starts to totally crater. There was a, we, we, we know, and some of you might have been in college or I don't, I don't know when, maybe even in high school, where there were foreclosures who, that were happening all over the country and Foreclosures are not just a statistic. We know that a foreclosure is a financial death sentence for a family. And if you look at the data, we can see everything from how foreclosures hurt neighborhoods. And they even are statistically significant in elementary school children's academic performance. Wow. There are, it is like a divorce. Um, actually worse in many cases. Children will report sleeplessness. They'll report other challenges at home. 
And I think we can't forget that financial catastrophes have human impacts, not just these statistical impacts. So, you know, I thought a lot about student loans more from what I saw as the avalanche of defaults that are occurring. So there is a default in America on a student loan more than once every 30 seconds. There are now 8 million Americans, over 8 million Americans, in default on a student loan. And for somebody who is 25 or 29 or 60, Defaulting on a student loan is going to make it harder to forget about getting a mortgage. You're going to have a tough time passing an employment verification check. You're going to have a tougher time even renting an apartment because more and more landlords, more and more employers are checking credit reports. And you're just going to have a much tougher time getting into the economy. People need cars in much of the country to get to work. They're going to have a tougher time getting an auto loan. There are going to be situations where people have a rough patch at home and need a credit card to get by. They're going to have a tougher time getting that. So for me, student loan defaults, and, and, I, and for those of you not familiar, there's these companies called student loan servicers. They're the company that you actually write the check to or pay. And they're the ones who are responsible for making sure you know your options and can avoid default. Now, I'm sure there's actually quite a bit of expertise in this room on borrowing for college. <laughs> so Alas. for those of you who know, federal student loans have these special protections that allow you to pay as a percentage of your income. So if, you are not if you're unemployed or not making much money, you can pay a much reduced amount. So in theory, why are people defaulting on a federal student loan? And the student loan industry wants to tell us all that it's because it's irresponsible millennials on Snapchat. And that is a lousy excuse for their own failure. Student loan servicers are the ones who should be telling you and walking you through how you can pay your loans. That is exactly what they are paid to do, but their business model maximizes profit by spending as little money as possible. When we were overseeing the student loan servicing industry, we would find that the loan servicers, the employees were actually rated based on how fast they could get you off the phone. Oh, God. Really? So when we saw the foreclosure crisis mm. and the mortgage, the mortgage servicers were also supposed to help be helping people modify their loans and avoid foreclosure. But some of them, like Aquin and other companies, actually made more when the homeowner went into foreclosure because they had a side business where they would work with the, the banks to deal with the foreclosure. And the loan servicers have really completely escaped accountability. And I think the CFPB, when we were there, really took a very hard look at them and forced them to finally be subject to some real oversight. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really made a difference, but we have much, much more to do. So I'll say that, um, Obviously, for many people who are not in default, student debt still feels like a, a bit of a weight on their shoulders. They feel like, and I feel it too, I'm still paying mine. I feel like it is something hanging out there. And while I'll be able to pay it off, I think sometimes it does change what you see as the possibilities. You feel like, I mean, I hear people all the time, we don't have good evidence other than public opinion polling, but people feel they really, you know, they, they're engaged, but they can't marry their, their future, future husband or wife because that person has too much student debt, or they feel like they can't yet save enough money for the down payment, or they feel like they can't yet um, take a risk of a lower paying job. Mm -hmm. 
um, and instead feel the heat mm -hmm. of selling out, which is, by the way, I mean, for, for, for those of you who have friends in law school, this is a huge piece of this, is that the, the career opportunities where they can make a big six-figure salary immediately after law school becomes very, very enticing when compared to something that they might have gone to law school to do mm -hmm. um, because of their student debt. So I don't like to discount that because I don't think that uh, we want people feeling inhibited, uh, inhibited by mm -hmm. that. In right. some ways, we want people to mm -hmm. feel like they should push forward. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we need to do more mm -hmm. to make sure that people are able to conquer mm -hmm. their debt easily mm -hmm. um, and that there's not unnecessary mm -hmm. defaults. But, um, you know, it's a big problem. I, I, will, I will share that Many of the foreclosures, and I'm sorry to bring up the housing and foreclosures a lot, but I really see that there's this is like an aftershock of that, and that if we don't learn the lesson of the subprime mortgages and foreclosures, we're, we're making a huge mistake. There was a major subprime style industry that rose in the years before 2008, and we really saw the rise of subprime style private student lending. So they were charging very high rates without having the clear protections of federal loans on the loan side. But then we saw this very interesting industry, um, which has always been a part of our history and always had challenges. But the for-profit schools are ones where you've always seen for quite a bit of time some degree of diploma mills, fraudulent schools. But in the 2000s, we really saw the rise of the big publicly traded mm -hmm. for-profit school. And that their goal to juice their stock price was to ramp up enrollment quickly. Mm -hmm. And when you have the incentive of not really focusing on whether students are landing in good jobs that they can easily pay their debt, but that instead the incentives are about, you know, pumping up the numbers to show to your investors mm -hmm. so that the CEO can score a big bonus. Mm -hmm. That creates real impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. The data will show that the disproportionate number of defaults are mm -hmm. focused on the for-profit sector. More than four times, they are more than four times overrepresented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is really tough is that they are all using taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. They are all, are all are using federal Pell Grants mm -hmm. and federal mm -hmm. student loans. And I, mm -hmm. I honestly don't blame the students mm -hmm. because the student is seeing a school is being accredited. It is something, it is a place they can get a Pell Grant at. It is so reasonable for them to assume mm -hmm. someone has checked into this. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out the people who are, have checked into it are completely asleep at the switch mm -hmm. or, com or totally mm -hmm. have conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. So you've all seen the big brand names of, and you've seen the ads, and I don't want to say they're all bad, but I think the business model raises some real questions mm -hmm. about whether they really are, whether their incentive is really mm -hmm. about student success mm -hmm. or whether it's simply mm -hmm. about kind of cashing out mm -hmm. on their stock options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So Rohit, it, it just seems like an overwhelming project to me. So you get to the CFPB. I mean, how did you determine what you would go after? Um, I mean, it seems to me that I mean, I was there. I know that you created the most amazing, the, the, what we used to call the student loan shopping sheet. I think it ended up with a different name, mm -hmm. but it was the coolest thing. Uh, Elizabeth Warren first did a mortgage sh shopping sheet, and then you did a student loan shopping sheet. And so obviously that was designed to help students. And I know you've had an immense number of hits, or you know, people have gone to use that. So, so that's to help the students. But then you also took on the for-profit colleges, the student loan servicers. I mean, how did you, it's like you're looking up on a mountain. How did you determine what you would go after? And, and did you have the bandwidth mm -hmm. to do it? Well, one of the th pieces of advice that I 
God. Um, and actually, it was a huge piece of being here at Penn was don't be scared of data. You know, being able, the, the, being able to look at the numbers and see where the problems are and looking at different ways of finding where those problems are. If you're able to see that the numbers are showing where the risk is, that's exactly where we went after. We got a lot of input early on. Focus on financial education, financial literacy. And over time, I learned that financial education and financial literacy, you know, it's like motherhood and apple pie. You, no one can oppose it. It's good. You can say, yes, let's teach people. But the data shows that it doesn't really do a damn thing. Hmm. You know, you can teach people and give them courses, but at the heat of the moment, they're not going to necessarily make the right choices. So going and, and really finding out where the defaults were, where the delinquencies were increasing, um, and analytically seeing those problems in the data. But it's also not just the numbers. It's also about the anecdote. And sometimes when the stories are very, very similar, you can see that there's smoke there. And one of the things I feel very, very strongly about is government agencies are always going to be flooded by hearing from lobbyists. But they don't do enough to reach out to people who are working on the ground. So here in Philadelphia and cities across the country, there are people who are you know, advocates for students and borrowers. There are people who are seeing up front what's going on. And I think you have to do both. You have to listen to what's happening in the real world, look at the numbers, and really see both and mm -hmm. say, this is where we need to focus our energies on. Mm -hmm. And not try and do everything, but p pick a couple things mm -hmm. and really go hard mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. it. So tell us a little bit, a little bit about your sort of most interesting stories or success stories. I know you've worked on veteran service member issues uh, and abuse there. I mean, that was an interesting uh, example, I think, of where you really made a difference. Yeah, I, I think other people really led the charge on it, but there are a few places where, um, m and many of them are. We have a huge number of of military families who uh, served in Iraq or Afghanistan. And the military has always been a target for sketchy financial practices. You know, our colleague used to say that many companies look at military members as nothing more um, than a dollar sign in a uniform. So we've always seen the payday lenders, the uh, sketchy auto dealers that, that, that invade military bases. But I think that we really looked, to, looked very hard about there are so many service members, active duty, who are actually paying their student loans. People have this completely uninformed view that most active duty service members are are people who just have a high school education. It's just not true. So many of them, and in fact, a huge number of them say that paying off their student debt is a reason for enlisting. And so one of the things we uncovered by listening to um, JAGs, Judge Advocates General, from listening to military advocates, and also by looking through consumer complaints we found and uncovered a massive scheme by Sally May and Navient to pick the pockets of 78,000 service members. And we ultimately ended up um, reaching a large settlement with them for $60 million to give refunds to all of these Isn't people. Cool. And we should know that um, regardless of where you stand on wars and foreign policy, um, you know, military families are part of our fabric of our country and kind of deserve, mm -hmm. deserve to be treated just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. There was also a very significant issue that continues to persist 
um, related to the GI Bill. So many of you are probably aware that after World War II, we passed the Montgomery GI Bill, a lot of, a lot, a lot of mostly young men to go to college. Um, and after 9-11, we passed the post-9-11 GI Bill, which was a much, it was a more generous benefit to allow um, veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan to, and, and other conflicts to, to uh, get a degree. And what we have seen is uh, a huge marketing machine by many of those for-profit schools that specifically target veterans um, to, to suck down that GI Bill money. Um, and the reason why, it's a little bit of a technical thing, but the law says that the for-profit schools, they must get at least 10% of their revenue from sources that are not related to federal student loans and Pell Grants. So they, uh, the reason why is they want to say, well, there should be some cash-paying customers, because that's like a market test to see if it's a good enough school. But there's a huge loophole which is that GI Bill money counts toward that 10%. So the industry vigorously targets veterans and service members um, to gulp down that GI Bill money. And the result mm -hmm. is what we hear from so many veterans is that they've, they're now out of luck because they feel like they've wasted um, that GI Bill, and now what kills me is that so many of them realize that the school is not worth the dime, and now they're borrowing lots of student loans to go to a new school. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I just think we have to completely fix that. Mm -hmm. um, and we've made progress, but there's just so much more mm -hmm. to do on mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Well, so standing up a, a little higher and looking down on the CFPB. Sorry, um, I'll be more positive. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and actually, what, what you didn't talk about was the very cool student loan shopping sheet, which, can I just say, it, it sure. not Financial only, aid shopping sheet. Financial aid shopping sheet. Not only does it give you what the, the rate is and this and that, but it also, doesn't it project what you might earn yes. in the career of your choice so that you can match what you can afford? I mean, that is cool. And yeah, practical. no, and now more than 2,000 colleges are using it. Um, and it allows people to kind of compare side by side. Because I think there's a feeling among so many people that when they're comparing colleges, they just feel like they don't know how to make the comparisons and they're diving in blindfolded when it comes to borrowing. So giving people a little bit more of a apples to apples mm -hmm. comparison just gives them a lot more confidence. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful tool. Um, so anyway, standing back a little bit, what do you think will happen to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? We, that's where we met, and I, I think I've bored you with it before, but as you may know, it's returned $12 billion to individuals. Quite a bit was in Rohit's area uh, in itty-bitty checks because of student loan fraud, mortgage fraud, you know, payday lenders, credit card fraud was a big one. And also, it's, it's uh, now answered just about one million complaints from individuals. So it's, it's really, in six years, it's done a huge, isn't that exciting? So exciting, so exciting. Um, and so I wonder now with this election, what you think will happen to it, God forbid, and you know, how can we protect it? Um, mm -hmm. and, and do you think that's enough that the Hill will support it now that, all, that so many constituents have been benefited? Yeah, it's funny. We were obviously both there at the at the beginning days, and I I think a lot about the early days of the SEC. So the SEC now is very very old, and it basically brought some minimal levels of fairness and transparency, essentially to stock markets at first, stock and bond markets, to allow investors to know basic information that had to be disclosed so that they could make the right choice about you know, making whether or not to buy a stock or a bond. And I always think to myself, if we did not have an SEC today, we would not have the markets that we have today. We certainly would not have um, 
Wharton MBAs kind of working all over Wall Street. I mean, we, it has created so much wealth um, for our country, probably a little con too concentrated, but at least it has created wealth because markets have confidence mm -hmm. that something is meeting basic standards of fairness. And I actually think that many people in the financial industry realize that shutting down the CFPB is like poking themselves in the eye with a knife. And they will realize that it's worse for them mm -hmm. because then the sort of sketchy, unregulated subprime lenders will return. That will hurt the honest, honest banks and the honest financial services providers. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder whether, it re whether the industry really even wants it to go away. Hmm. Now, I'll tell you, I think it would be a complete disaster, um, both substantively and politically, for people to try mm -hmm. and, and dismantle it. And I'll tell you, there is a, there is a cottage industry in Washington that likes to point out how government doesn't work, and they CFPB drives them nuts because, <laughs> because it, it just feels like it's working. It feels like it's actually doing its job for consumers. Mm -hmm. It's giving, I mean, you know, the new mortgage disclosures, you, you know, the old way of doing mortgage disclosures, you couldn't, you could barely get through it. And now it's just so much more clear what you're looking at when you're making the biggest investment in your, in your personal financial life. Mm -hmm. the, the whole system of what I talked about before, mortgage servicing, you know, now rushing you off the phone, um, there's a counterweight to that, mm -hmm. that people now know that it is the obligation for the servicer to really fess up to you about mm -hmm. what your options are. And, and honestly, I think we've all had an issue where an overdraft fee shows up or a mystery fee is there. And, and now that's really going down mm -hmm. because somebody is actually watching yeah, for yeah. it. And so I want to dare people mm -hmm. to try and yeah. mess with it because mm -hmm. I really think that um, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a political thing. It is a, it's something about keeping mm -hmm. the economy um, and, yeah. and just having basic rights of fairness. Right. Well, and we all have, possibly all have examples. I do, I know, of a new Wells Fargo debit card that arrived, and it, it, my old one hadn't expired. And, you know, I'm like, what is this? What do you think of the Wells situation? I mean, was that a good thing or a bad thing for its preservation? Well, so for those of you who hadn't followed it, Wells Fargo, uh, which is obviously one of our largest banks, um, in the country and the world was engaged in a massive fake account scandal where they opened, I believe, about two million fake accounts without the authorization of the customer. And I think it really, and, and the CFPB and, and uh, others reached a, fined them $185 million for it. And it ultimately led to the CEO of Wells Fargo stepping down to me, there's a little bit of a larger lesson there, which is why is it the, in, why, sometimes it feels like there's incentives for executives to turn a blind eye. And it was either, bo both answers are bad to the question, did you know this was happening? <laughs> So either the CEO and the board knew it was happening and did nothing, or they didn't know it was happening and it was a massive, massive fake accounts, fraudulent you know, conspiracy. And so there's no good answer to it. And you know, there is no question that they liked the idea of cross-selling. And a lot of people in the financial industry are interested in cross-selling, selling more people products. And, you know, that's, it, it, it is a huge proof point for why you need a CFPB. Mm -hmm. And it is also, was important for the public to, I think, see that 
uh, you need a CFPB. And for, for all the community banks and smaller banks out there who would never do something like this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they were rooting it on. Right. They wanted to see Level playing field, yeah. someone being punished mm -hmm. for what was clearly mm -hmm. um, deeply illegal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Fascinating. Now you get to ask all of your questions. So I think we have, how long do we have? Lauren, where, are, where is my Lauren? We have, how, how long, about 20 minutes more? So let me ask the first. 20, how, how much longer, 20 minutes? OK, great. Let me ask the first question of you, though. Oh, yes. Which is that I think both of us were at the CFPB in the early days mm -hmm. at um, different parts of our careers and mm -hmm. lives. And what did you, what, what, what's your reflection uh, on it? That's an interesting question. So yes, well, Rohit and I met in um, 20, 2010. 2010, and the CFPB had just been created. Uh, and I think I've told you all this anyway, my history. But um, it was the most wonderful year of my professional life, that first year, the 15 months from um, the very beginning. Uh, we were among the first 10 or 12 employees there. They're now 1,400, I think. Um, so it was just a fascinating, uh, fascinating experience. We actually were talking a little bit earlier about looking back now, it looked like a really risky thing that we did. Um, but we, we were just magnetized, uh, both of us, to it for different reasons, one of which was, of course, its, its leader who was, you know, if you're lucky enough to find a leader of that caliber ever in your life, just go with that person. Um, but it was the combination of a leader of that caliber, that's Elizabeth Warren, of course, and the mission that was so, so exhilarating. Um, and the fact that it was a blank slate, you know, we had a blank canvas that we could paint on, and we had a very powerful bill. Um, yes, it was 2,300 pages, the centerpiece was our CFPB. Um, so it was a really un unbelievable recipe. Yeah, I, my reflection is f the takeaway I always feel is that, um, I think if I were to rewind from when I was a student that I was going to be looking for a job that had very specific parameters, that I was going to have these, this list of job responsibilities. And I think what I learned from it was you have to accept uncertainty. And sometimes having an uncertain career option can really allow you to find yourself and find your own voice. Uh, and if you have, I think you raised a good point, if you like the mission and you like the leadership, uh, it gives you a lot of ability to really find out what your true motivating force is in your life. And you all of a sudden, your job and career becomes very much together with your own life's purpose. Mm -hmm. And that is a really um, deeply satisfying thing. Mm -hmm. And what's good is that um, you have to know, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, it, some of the best jobs are the most unglamorous. Um, we were crowded five people <laughs> in an office. Sometimes we didn't even have computers and tables, yeah. but there was a sense of mission and purpose, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. um, I, I will never forget mm -hmm. kind of those early mm -hmm. days. Yeah, no, if you, if you visited us in, in those days in that agency, we, we were, it was real government issue, like gray and green, and I mean, we didn't even have, we had nothing. We didn't have post-it notes, but we had such, such excitement and spirit, yeah, very lucky time, very lucky time. Okay, who has a question? I wish I could be up there interviewing because I have a hundred questions. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. um, you get one at least. I'm going to do one. <laughs> you also have a mic. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Mike. Please also, don't uh, ask a hundred part question. Um, <laughs> so we, we started clapping the conservative and the liberal back here on uh, Consumer Financial Protection Board. I think it's amazing. So one of the questions I have is your opinion on reverse mortgages. Mm -hmm. And to me, it seems like it's the next subprime crisis if it eventually continues to, to, to grow in popularity. It's very small now. But I'm curious about your work 
in that space as reverse mortgages grow yeah. and, and, and if, 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 if the government's objective and what is the government's objective, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so for those of you who are not familiar, reverse mortgage permits a senior to essentially take their home that is generally fully paid for um, and able to draw some proceeds from the equity of that home and that theoretically when they pass away in that home that they will, um, you know, all, all things kind of even out. This is obviously not a huge area of my expertise, but I think reverse mortgages are something that you want to be careful that it doesn't get prone to abuse um, because I hate to say it, there are many people who are senior citizens who even their sons and daughters don't have their best financial interests at heart because they might have their own incentives. Um, so right now there's, there's kind of, the Department of Housing and Urban Development has a reverse mortgage framework. The CFPB enforces some of those reverse mortgage rules. And we haven't seen uh, huge problems but I agree with you that it's something that I'm not sure the reverse mortgage is really uh, a, a substitute for retirement savings. And I think if you look at the data, so many people uh, don't have sufficient retirement savings. And I think you're right that reverse mortgages are going to keep growing. And so it's something that the CFPB has released a lot of data about. Um, so that people can kind of keep a close eye on it. But yeah, I, I share that worry. I share that worry. I have a little bit of a bigger worry about this product called Pension Advance. So it's essentially a, a payday loan style product that is targeted at people with pensions or where they can cash out early of a pension but it has an effective uh, APR that is sometimes you know double or triple digits. But yeah, we got it. We got to I encourage you for those of you who have kind of older parents or grandparents, um, you know, many of them don't don't have the same intuition in terms of doing their own research online. They tend to to often trust uh, people they've heard, and they're certainly just like in the service member and military um, sector, there's a lot of people who are out to get them. Um, and it's sad, but we got to keep an eye on it. Yes. All right, so. Oh, sorry. There was a, okay. I was just going to say, it seems like you're at the nexus of a bunch of very interesting things. That The other round of applause that was given earlier was when you were talking <laughs> about, uh, you know, people sitting on one side of the table, and you see them on the other side of the table, and we need, you know, a certain brand of people <coughs> who may or may not you know, cross over to the other side. Um, I guess my question is, given debt and student debt and the amount of money that people pay to go to certain yeah. programs, um, you know, it feels like the nonprofit or government sector is one of the one of the sectors that relies so much on a specific personality type that will continue to be like you are very best, like the best and the brightest, but also have this heart in which you will continue to be paid less than. What maybe you went into debt to do, mm -hmm. or perhaps mm -hmm. what somebody else is willing to do. So I think sometimes it's you know we can get at this like ah yeah like we're not gonna cross over to work for the other side. But at the other side, if you're super in debt to pay for a Fells education mm -hmm. or a Harvard education mm -hmm. for government, I think there is this kind of sense people like do their time and then move on to make their money because they did their service. How, how do we prevent that wheel from happening? Yeah. Is there? Well, that's fine. People can do their service. I just don't want them working immediately for the people that they regulate. Right. And so there are many people who go into uh, the private sector. They advise companies. They, look in, they work in a wide array of, of private sector opportunities. But scheming with their clients on how to trick the regulators based on their own inside knowledge, I think that's wrong. Do you think that there's also, is there some sort of large systemic trick to keep some of those folks? Yeah, so, so, so I guess that's my question. Yeah, so, so I think number one, um, I actually really believe in um, really changing kind of public service 
<laughs> as a, we do a lot of public service loan forgiveness, although I'm not sure sometimes how valuable it really is. But theoretically, it's a good thing. Um, no one has received it yet under the federal program, but next year we will see the first crew of people doing it. I think a part of it is um, we do need to, one of the easy answers, people, I, I, when I talk to teachers a lot, uh, the student debt is just such a huge issue. And there's a lot of ways to subsidize the student debt, but some of it is just we should maybe invest in, if we think teaching is an important part of our society that can't just be measured economically, then maybe we should make teaching programs cheaper. Yeah. Um, and if we, think if we think public service is a good, a social good, then rather than subsidizing on in the back end, maybe we should think about is it worth on the front end. So I don't know the specific answer to it, but I think what I was raising before to me is about integrity of the government, which is that I would like to see our ethics and revolving door restrictions really change. So, you know, not, not just a ban on immediately switching sides or official cooling off periods, but I actually think there are real questions that the legal profession has to ask itself about whether it is appropriate for people to hide out at a law firm um, before heading into their next stint in government. And I think it's very pervasive in the legal industry, where there are people who essentially have very valuable inside information that they, that they cash in on. So I would like to see ethics laws be strengthened so that not only uh, can you not you know, switch sides on a, on a case, but also that you, you take a cooling off period that you don't necessarily serve legal clients for a period of time after you leave some of these regulatory agencies. I also think there's a, a, a we've got to, we've got to kill these uh, golden parachutes. So the golden parachutes are what these clauses in, um, and it's big in the banking industry where you, you know, so they're often paid through stock options that vest over time. But, if you enter a government job, you get a one-time vesting and often a big bonus. So to me, they make an argument that, well, we don't want to disincentivize people going into public service. But I think when people hear of someone taking a government job, but their last employer gave them a $10 million bonus for leaving, it makes you wonder are they really going to forget that generosity? <laughs> and I think that's something that should actually be illegal. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Next question, yes, right here, second row, third row. So you kind of put a wrench in my heart earlier when you said financial literacy in education doesn't really achieve I'm much. sorry. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. Yeah, that was hard. The thing is, I've just always been a firm believer in gaining those skills, especially in the benefit of marginalized communities, like you know, access to capital and being able to balance checks. So you're the expert, so I just like to you know understand why you said that. Yeah. You know, so like I think that. there are many of those programs that do show. The empirical literature do show some improvements. There are a lot, and I think there's been a pretty strong indictment of the high school courses. So the high school courses, uh, there's always been a movement like, let's require in high school and college people to take an investing course. And actually, some of the data show that when people take those courses, they actually make worse decisions, and they take too much risk, particularly men. <laughs> so males that I think learn as adolescents, I, rem I can't remember the exact study, mm -hmm. they end up just taking much more risk because they think they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said. Oh, I love it. I did not say that note. He did. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the question is, is I'm not saying that financial education is not good. What I'm saying is that we should look empirically as to what works 
and financial education is not a substitute for enforcement. So there is a common belief that the government should just focus on this, but no, no amount of financial education is really gonna save you if you're being utterly lied to. Mm -hmm. So I think, I apologize if I, I was too strong on that, but I think being very analytical on seeing what works um, rather than making an assumption. And I'll tell you, like, it's very intuitive. Like, yeah, let's teach in high schools uh, um, how to, how to uh, you know, get, take out a mortgage. But r really, what I do understand is, to, is very effective is increasing levels of numeracy. So maybe actually focusing and evolving how you teach math so that it's more realistic um, may actually be better than having a separate financial education curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yes. Coming from the data that state law requires financial um, state law requires financial literacy education in high school, but oftentimes it's just students get a, a book and they're told to mm -hmm. read it on their own spare time, mm -hmm. so it doesn't really accomplish the, the goals that the state you know, set out. Uh, my question is regarding your thought process when you were considering joining the administration and working in consumer protection and working with Senator Warren. Um, for those of us you know, who, um, who are here, a lot of us have read about how you and the Obama administration had a number of tensions with regard to how you versus the administration saw the direction of federal loans, um, protecting students from unscrupulous for-profit colleges. And it was interesting to hear how you decided to join the administration and work on these issues from the inside as opposed to maybe staying outside the system and advocating um, from another perspective. So I'm curious as to what your thought process was when you decided to join the, the government. Well, and I, I think issues. it can be overplayed about whether there was huge disagreement between me and, and, and the Obama administration. I was always working very closely with them. Now, that being said, as an independent agency, and that's one of the best parts of the CFPB is it had an independent perspective and analytical approach. Um, but ultimately, I thought going to the Department of Education was a great way to um, really help uh, build a regulatory culture there, an oversight culture, a consumer protection culture because it often feels to people that the Department of Education is a K-12 policy shop that runs a trillion dollar bank on the side. And really that trillion dollar student loan program should be managed with integrity, should be protecting taxpayers, and should be protecting students. And I think we have a long way to go there. But um, I, I do, I mean, I mean, there's some other people in the crowd who might have some different views than me on this, but. I think we, we, we are making progress that the education department is kind of flexing its muscles and making sure that schools that are completely ripping off students um, are getting kicked out of the programs. So I, th I think that's important. It did say, Rohit, though, in your biography that when you were at Harvard and you were president of the student body, that's where you learned to stand up to the faculty and be difficult. <laughs> I mean, in a, po in a positive sense. You, yeah, you, well, I think the, um, I think there's always times when uh, using official channels to, there's, a, there's an inside and an outside game. Um, sometimes you wanna make sure that voices are yelling loud, because often, you know, in, in, in college campuses, there's always people who laugh off protest. And what's funny is that when you're working in government on the inside, protest, you hear it. And it affects you and it makes you think differently. And um, thinking about the inside and the outside is always important. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How about somebody in the back? All the way in the back. You spoke uh at length about private institutions of higher education. How culpable do you think uh, nonprofit as well as public institutions are as it relates to the student loan crisis? Oh, well, there's, 
When it comes to our broken student loan system, the amount of blame that can be passed around is very wide. Um, I will say, for public institutions, uh, this is a little bit of an untold story. The financial crisis, uh, everyone knows it. It just, it just bludgeoned household balance sheets. It bludgeoned family finances. What has not been written about enough, which sort of grates at me, is that state tax receipts plummeted because of the financial crisis. And one of the first things on the chopping block was public higher education. And you saw some very substantial tuition increases in, in states across the country because of that reduction in funding. So I, I think that um, for many state institutions, I'm not saying they're fully, you know, they're, they're, they don't have some skin in the game on trying to lower costs, and many of them should be doing much better. But I do think the, the amount, if we look at the University of California, if we look at Penn State, if we look at Ohio State, the amount it used to cost for a family to go was much more reasonable. And I mean, it's shocking that for some people to go in state, it is now a very substantial portion of family income. And I think that is a, that is a huge driver of student debt. I realize that we're sitting here on this Ivy League campus, but most people um, go to community college and public four-year higher education. So that, that's a big piece of it. Now, Nonprofit schools, um, there's a huge diversity uh, of them in, in, in their affordability. I think, I think sometimes uh, if you look at Europe, uh, many of them are much more, there's a culture of being much more vocal in terms of backlashes against uh, tuition increases. And here uh, we are, we've unfortunately just started to accept it. When, we're, we, when in reality, we need to push back on them when they occur. OK, great. Two more questions. Let's do one at the back. Uh, how about right here? I shouldn't be drinking this while I'm here. Oh, you're, doing, <laughs> you're doing fine. <laughs> so a lot of the power of the CFPB comes from its rulemaking authority. How do you th feel that that will be affected with the new, new administration? Will that like, be a rollback of some of the Hunger laws? Will that be mm -hmm. some of the you know, payday lending? What, mm -hmm. How do you think that will affect that? Yeah, so I, I, I got to tell you, um, I don't like to be in the prediction business, because uh, anyone who is these past few weeks has been proved wrong. But the, <laughs> I think it really matters uh, who's in leadership. Uh, and if there's someone in leadership who really wants to execute the mission of the Bureau, then those rules will keep going um, and that they'll stay closely. But a as a technical matter, which I think may be what you're asking, is that uh, no matter who the leadership is, they can't just choose to toss rules out. Um, there is a process by which um, rules are changed and we have the public is protected to make sure that there can't be willy-nilly uh, changes like that. So I don't know. I'm not somebody who really ever bets against the CFPB, um, because I will tell you from day one from when we were there, people would laugh at me when they, I told them I was quitting a job to go work there, because they would say, that place is going to be shut down any day now. And it's been six years Right. they've been saying that. And every time they say it, yeah. They failed, um, and so I don't know. I, I don't have a good yeah. answer for you, but I'm hoping that there's determined leadership mm -hmm. that will keep well, keep going with yeah. what it's doing. But, but there are three things, just quickly, that could happen. One is is that Rich Cordray can be fired now because of the recent court case, right, which the, says the president can get rid of him. Two, they they've always threatened to make it part of appropriations. It's now independent, and it's part of the Fed. And the third is the five person commission. So. Those are the things they're threatening, right? Yeah, but uh, at the end of the day, if I was somebody, for people who are members of Congress, I don't know in this environment if they really want to be seen as shilling for predatory lenders. 
Um, and that's really voting for mm -hmm. uh, supporting um, supporting gutting the CFPB like that mm -hmm. by starving it of resources mm -hmm. or by creating structures that really don't allow it to do its job. Mm -hmm. There's no real good argument for it mm -hmm. other than um, representing those who uh, are essentially breaking the law. Right, and I think Wells, Wells helped there. Okay, last question. All right, we go right here. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so, as you as you noted earlier, uh, correctly, I think it seems like there's a growing consensus that um, this election showed uh, deep mistrust of the so-called establishment, mm -hmm. right? Um, but establishment is one of those funny words that everyone uses to refer to other people, uh, never themselves. So, uh, your advice for uh, a room full of um, aspiring Ivy League graduates, right? the elites, um, that's going to be a, a real perception. It's a concern, I think, for many people. It seems to me to be a, a disconnect. So people who view themselves maybe as egalitarians but are not perceived as such uh, by others. Uh, I appreciate your comments on that. Yeah, so I, I always I mean, think of this as individuals within an institution. So I would ask you, whenever you're a part of an institution that is doing something wrong, do you look the other way and accept it, or do you say something about it? And I think that that really matters. Um, you're totally right. And I wouldn't just say it's this Ivy League campus. I would also say it's um, you know, living in major metropolitan areas where that are, that are programmed differently and, and look and feel much different than um, much of America, and I, I do really, I want to reiterate something, and I hope it's responsive to what you're asking, that having a good feel for what is really happening on the ground, if you're entering government, public service at any level, don't just trust people who are summarizing it for you. Kind of listen yourself and go find out do your own investigation, because sometimes that can make sure that you're grounded in what's really happening and not what's happening, not what's being filtered by essentially special interests. So I agree with you. All of us need to look hard. Look, all of us held government positions of power, and we need to all hold ourselves more accountable and make sure we're being responsive. Um, but that, that's, that's for all of you, too. Everybody recognizing their own sort of sources of privilege and um, being, being able to attend good institutions and being able to access uh, jobs and opportunities and recognizing that you got to make the most of it and that you can't just uh, rely on a system that sometimes just feels rigged against a lot of other people. We could talk forever. Rohit, thank you. Fabulous. All right. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Rohit. That was spectacular. And